Thank you so much for watching the latest AI Weekly update from Henry AI Labs. This edition will be uh, more of a quick preview of these things compared to you know the hour-long videos that have a bit of a deeper dive, but hopefully you still find this useful for getting a quick recap of all these new papers that have come out this week and kind of the major themes of these advances, which are going to be grouped into self-supervised learning advances, MoCo v3, revisiting simple neural language models, uh, self-supervised learning framework for time series hyperparameter search, and a BERT-style multitask self-supervised learning algorithm that has a really cool uh, looking architecture and achieves impressive performance as well. Then we'll see the uh, general purpose vision systems from the Allen Institute, a way of unifying uh, all these vision language tasks in a single architecture, kind of similar to say like the T5 text input, text output, how that uh, unifies all these tasks into a, into one kind of architecture and one kind of input output framework. It's a similar idea of a unifying uh, vision and language tasks like visual question answering and also being able to do image classification or text classification or even like natural language inference, something like that. So we'll look at this uh, really great uh, survey video on generative adversarial networks. I really enjoyed watching this and I definitely think you will as well. And then an extension of this kind of, you learn more about uh, F divergences and then particularly in F divergence known as LeCam divergence, how you can implement that and improve on training GANs with limited data using this different kind of uh, loss regularization in the discriminator. So very interesting with that. And then natural language processing, different ideas, uh, different ways of thinking about generalization, covariate shift, does your classifier know what it doesn't know? And then some really cool tools that you can use for coding, GBT Neo, and then uh, PyTorch Lightning and DeepSpeed and a collection of other really cool uh, tricks that you can use in PyTorch Lightning. I think personally, I'm starting to be convinced of using PyTorch Lightning as well, especially with this article. And then we'll look at the ICLR 2021 best papers. It's pretty interesting. Some of them are extremely technical and uh, you know some new ideas and it's always interesting to see kind of like the intersection between these other fields and then uh, deep learning Starting with MoCo v3 the authors following the sequence of MoCo MoCo v2 and then uh, I think these authors are also uh, Responsible for the sim siam algorithm where they stop the gradient in the uh, second view encoder And it's a simple framework for doing this Siamese network contrastive representation learning that improves the performance and you know simplifies this landscape with say things like suave or uh, maybe bootstrap your own latent tooth. some of these more complex algorithms and then the sim siam shows that you can kind of reduce it to the simple framework and that's also a theme of this paper that's why i'm bringing it up because they reduce the moco framework uh, they get away with things like uh, they remove the uh, memory queue which you can find here in the paper and then they find so without the memory queue the moco batch is really just uh, bootstrap your own latent with the momentum running average of the other encoder and but what they do is similar to say SimClear is they crank up the batch size to 4096 so using large batches tends to improve this contrastive learning because you have more terms on the uh, the negatives to regularize the loss function so uh, the big thing they're investigating with this study is how well does the vision transformer replace the say the ResNet in this kind of Siamese contrastive learning framework and what they find is that they have this uh, this instability with training. So they find as you walk across the epochs, it just suddenly the performance just drops with the, with the training curves. And so the way that they solve this in the paper is they uh, use a fixed patch projection. So what happens in the vision transformer, uh, this architecture from Google AI, this where there's um, you split the images into patches and then you learn a patch projection that turns it back into a like, like a vector embedding then you concatenate the vectors put that matrix into you know the transformer input so what they do is instead of learning that projection from the 16 by 16 image patches into the vector space they have a random fixed way of going from that patch into the vector space and that seems to improve the performance so uh, if you're more interested in this paper there's a lot of ablations taking apart different ideas about uh, applying the vision transformer for contrastive self-supervised learning in a uh, slightly modified version of the momentum contrastive encoder framework. Here's another paper that was extremely popular when it was uh, you know, promoted on Twitter, revisiting simple neural probabilistic language models. And I think it's so popular because it has the same kind of uh, premise of things like the bitter lesson from Richard Sutton, this idea that uh, algorithms aren't really getting better, it's just that we're scaling up computing and that's the real idea. So this idea is they're repurposing the uh, neural probabilistic language model. Basically you have a fixed window to predict um, predict the next word in language modeling. The drought had lasted now for 10 million, mask, predict the mass out token and so on. So they have a fixed window and the key difference is that the context is much smaller and the architecture is different. So you don't have these self-attention layers, you just have 
uh, these feed forward layers and this kind of architecture, but they're scaling up the depth and the width uh, like crazy, like a crazy scale that's never been tested before. And so what they do find that's interesting is that this outperforms the transformer with short with short sequences. So you know, say this kind of sequence where you only have uh, eight words in it, it would perform better than the transformer. And then um, probably one other thing that I should have included is that they do have this kind of way of encoding the past context and summarizing it into a single uh, token that goes in the beginning of the sequence. So it's kind of similar to say uh, transformer XL or compressive transformer, where you have some kind of recurrence that takes in this uh, previous sequence. It's not just the fixed window. And later, later in the paper, they describe how they can kind of integrate that with the transformer design and improve on it with some of the lessons from this kind of neural probabilistic language model architecture. But so overall, I think, uh, you know, it's interesting that it performs better on the short input sequences, but is that really, uh, is that really that useful? I think the long sequences with all these latest advances, like say like the big bird architecture, the reformer and so on, the push in the transformer in computer and uh, natural language processing is to attend over longer sequences, longer input sequences seems to be kind of like the holy grail goal of this. So. I, thought, I definitely thought it was an interesting paper, this kind of uh, bitter lesson idea of that all you need to do is scale up these old algorithms. But I don't think it really outperforms the transformer from what uh, I've read in this paper. Next up, Facebook's AI research blog has published a blog post corresponding with their paper on large scale forecasting self-supervised learning framework for hyperparameter tuning. So what this is describing is this is using a hyperparameter search algorithm for model selection as well as the hyperparameter selection of the model for time series forecasting. So they describe how they have uh, infrastructure data at Facebook and this other, uh, I think they call it like M3 competition. They don't really exactly describe uh, what the data is, but it's a time series data set. They have these different, uh, say like autoaggressive kind of models that then take in different features. In the paper, they describe these features more like things like uh, seasonality, peak, these kinds of ideas that describe uh, time series data. So you have the feature selection algorithm and then you have the best model. And the idea of uh, the paper, I think there's two parts of it. The first of which is you're predicting which classifier is gonna perform best, kind of like this no free lunch theorem idea where you have to you know, look through all these different machine learning models to see which one is gonna perform the best on some uh, new problem. So you use this framework of self-supervised learning as this idea of uh, the autoregressive modeling of time series data where you know you have data from say nine days and you predict day 10 and then you use the window of the 10 days to predict day 11 these kinds of ideas of forming self-supervised learning tasks with time series data so they train a model on this previously collected data to predict which classifier is going to perform best given some new time series and then given the features that have been selected for this uh, inference of which model should we use. And then the similar kind of framework of uh, predicting which set of hyperparameters to use. So it's kind of an interesting idea of using like a predictive framework to do uh, model selection and hyperparameter tuning, and definitely not something that's been uh, heavily explored. So here's a really interesting new architecture that was proposed this week in self-supervised learning, combining the ideas with the vision transformer. So the paper is titled SIT Self-Supervised Vision Transformer. And here's the architecture that is really interesting. So. It looks very similar to, uh, say, BERT models, where we have uh, different kinds of, where we have this encoder kind of framework where we index the different positions on the outputs to do the different tasks. So, say, uh, in BERT, you index the CLS token, and that's where you do uh, next sentence prediction when you're doing uh, pre training. And then you have the prediction of the patches in the uh, masked out token part of it. So, this architecture is unifying these different uh, tasks that have been developed for self supervised learning in uh, computer vision. So, in computer vision, they had these pretext tasks that were like uh, rotation prediction uh, or uh, jigsaw puzzle scrambling. It wasn't just uh, contrastive learning. So, they're unifying these three different, the three dominant ways of doing self supervised learning, which is uh, probably the most dominant thing is doing, or these two things, obviously. This first thing is, uh, you know, the generative modeling, where you say do auto encoding, you mask out patches, and then you reconstruct the masked out patches. This is the contrastive embedding, where you're doing that thing where you uh, do two augmentations of the same image, and then you, uh, you know, have this positive distance, negative distance, super popular idea. And then you have the rotation idea, where you rotate it 90 degrees, predict how much the image has been rotated. So they're unified all in this single architecture, and it performs all these tasks at once in this kind of multitask learning framework. And then they actually show that uh, this does perform better. So I think the results are at the top, or they're at the bottom. But it's interesting because there's, you know, multitask learning, it's difficult to not have the gradients like pull the network in all these different directions such that you can't really optimize it. But apparently with the uh, transformer, it's easier to do this kind of multitask optimization. Similar to say maybe the T5 model again, where you have this multitask learning framework where you do text input, text output, such that you're unifying the question answering data with the natural language inference data with the language modeling data, and it's still able to perform well at all these tasks without the gradients from the different tasks, uh, you know, causing it to not be optimized.
So this is another really interesting architecture, another interesting new approach to self-supervised learning and thinking about the architectures that will be used to form these encodings and form these embeddings in the self-supervised learning framework. In a similar vein is looking for an architecture that can unify all these different tasks towards general purpose vision systems is looking to unify all these different tasks of vision and language modeling into one architecture. So say we have things like visual question answering where you uh, provide an image and then you ask questions like what color is the dog? Are there trees being seen? Or uh, now we're doing uh, bounding box uh, detection or localization where you're asking it to locate the dog and you want it to output this uh, bounding box around the dog and then also generate a description for the image, image captioning, and then what is this? And then you can pass in an image as input to this same kind of framework. This is showing a different way of forming. This no longer has anything to do with the dog image. This would be, I think this is a, an entirely new example of providing a new image and then a new text prompt. So it's overall probably this is a better view of it. So we have this framework where you can put as inputs uh, images and text. You can choose to ignore, to not put in an image and then ignore, not put in a text uh, sequence. And it can do this uh, framework of encoding the image, encoding the text, unifying, having this cross modal attention on the vision representation to the text representation, outputting the bounding boxes, the object nests, and then the, the text decoder. So if it was uh, a task like, as shown in clip, you can turn these uh, image classification tasks into uh, sequence to sequence learning pretty easily where you just, uh, the question would be, uh, what object is this? And then it would output dog. So that's kind of how you would put in image classification and you know any task that you can imagine, you can, that's popular in, computer vision or natural language processing, you can imagine fitting into this kind of framework. I'm really excited to present this survey on generative adversarial networks, fundamentals, and recent advances. This is it. This is probably the best survey on GANs that I've seen out there so far, and I really, really highly recommend watching this. So uh, it covers all these different topics, beginning with this idea of why are we interested in GANs, uh, comparing the implicit density models compared to explicit density models. So with variational autoencoders and normalizing flows, the benefit of that is you know the distribution of the generated data because you're with variational autoencoders you're doing the sampling trick you're sampling those z vectors from a predefined distribution and it kind of behaves nicely like that or at least that's how i understand it and then uh, normalizing flows you also have the explicit density of the generated distributions to say that uh, P of X that comes out of the generator, you have that explicit density model. Uh, then going into the semantic properties, how we can you know morph these faces together is you know one of the most amazing ideas of GANs when you can uh, do this latent space interpolation where you walk along the latent vectors that produce these two images to produce these uh, meshes of images and uh, you know going between that space. So then it presents these different ideas for the random noise samplings in the generator, uh, the problems with sampling from a normal distribution with these z vectors the uh, solution of the uniform spherical distribution, and then another solution that's been successful, the style GAN strategy of learning this uh, noise space with the W mapping networks. Uh, the presentation then uh, goes deep into this idea of how do you compare two probability distributions. And this, pre this part of the presentation, I think, is really uh, useful for people trying to understand these ideas of, say, uh, F divergences compared to, say, the Wasserstein GAN. So the F divergences are these different ways of how to compare two probability distributions, things like KL divergence, Jensen's Shannon divergence, these kinds of ideas. And then particularly this convex conjugate idea, how do you show that you can uh, do this Monte Carlo estimation trick where you're just you know sampling data points compared to looking at the full density to compare the distributions and how that works out. Uh, then talking about the non-saturating GAN when you have the uh, optimal discriminator and how to overcome, how to still have a learning signal when the discriminator is optimal. Then describing uh, the other class of ways of comparing these distributions, which is the subtraction methods, things like Wasserstein GAN and optimal transport to compare the two uh, probability distributions. And then in order to uh, do Wasserstein GAN, you need to have, you need to regularize the discriminator. So you do things like gradient penalties or this idea of the Lipschitz normal to make it uh, this Lipschitz constant thing where changes in the function uh, don't, the function doesn't change too dramatically at any point and it's bounded by this constant showing uh, it's a pretty technical analysis of these ideas. So I highly re recommend just uh, kind of watching the presentation. Uh, then it describes some of the more intuitive ideas like limiting the receptive field to the discriminator. So it just looks at patches or some kind of idea like that. How do we add data augmentation to the GANs? Uh, the exponential moving average of weights, that kind of regularization idea. And then uh, how do we evaluate these generated, generated images? So we have ideas like uh, the Frechet inception distance or the inception score, comparing the features of the, like the class, like putting it through a pre-trained classifier and then using that to compare the features of generated images compared to the real images and all these different ideas of how do we actually, uh, you know, evaluate and uh, 
you know, compare these generated generative image models. So a really great presentation going through many different topics and a really technical analysis on some of the most important ideas, which are these F divergences and these Wasserstein GANs, different ways of comparing the real and fake probability distribution for structuring the loss function for the uh, overall framework. To further motivate this interest in understanding these F divergences and these different ways of comparing two probability distributions for structuring the loss functions and the framework in generative adversarial networks, this paper regularizing generative adversarial networks under limited data shows these gains using just a change to the loss function. So in integrating this anchor idea into the discriminator and then using this moving average of the discriminator parameters is able to uh, achieve this better performance. So. Compared to things like, say, the adaptive discriminator augmentation thing, the training GANs of limited data paper from NVIDIA where they use uh, data augmentation, or this other thing, ultra data efficient GANs where they show the, uh, the interplay between the lottery ticket hypothesis, sparse subnetworks, and then uh, heavy data augmentation in the feature space, so doing an adversarial augmentation search, but directly in the feature space. They use all these complex controllers, well, which are uh, maybe more intuitive than this kind of idea of the you know taking apart the f divergences and that kind of idea but showing that there are two different there are many different ways of thinking about how to improve the uh, gan framework so hopefully just maybe seeing this new paper out and getting a sense of this idea that uh, looking at the loss function is also still a very promising way of improving the gans and as shown in this paper it leads to the latest state of the art in training gans with limited label data which is a very interesting uh, kind of sub problem of the GAN training. So you see with only 10% of the data performing much better than the big GAN version and then big GAN with data augmentation. Next up, we have comparing transfer and meta learning approaches on a unified few shot classification benchmark. So the paper motivates this idea that meta learning and transfer learning both have the same goal of few shot learning being able to learn with less labeled data, even though they're not frequently compared with one another. And that's because uh, they describe this well, where they describe how the meta learning idea is trying to find an algorithmic solution. So say uh, the model agnostic meta learning algorithm, mammal or reptile or something like that, there are these algorithms for trying to learn how to quickly adapt to the parameters and uh, shift these distributions, whereas uh, transfer learning is more focused on the data space. So trying to find uh, a way to use, say, unlabeled data like transfer learning from uh, the contrastive learning algorithms like SimCLR, MoCo, transferring that into some limited labeled data tasks. So as expected, uh, transfer learning still performs better than meta learning, even on these meta learning benchmarks like the metadata set, and then meta learning especially can't do this uh, the transfer learning benchmark, which is the visual task adaptation benchmark. I think Yana Kilcher has made a video on this if you're curious about that benchmark as well. And the metadata said also a really interesting data set. So here are the key takeaways of the study, as stated just like right in the abstract. We find that the large scale transfer methods outperform the approaches on the metadata set. So it's showing that transfer learning performs better than, say, MAML or stuff like that on this metadata set, even when transfer learning only comes from uh, the ImageNet pre training. And then in contrast, Meta learning struggles on the transfer learning benchmark, but then it shows that uh, you know transfer learning is isn't not without limitations. It still doesn't uh, perform these highly added distribution meta learning tasks. So when the uh, meta data set is highly added distribution with respect to how you're sampling and reconfiguring these few shot learning tasks, you're out of luck with transfer learning as well. So a really interesting comparison. I highly recommend uh, checking out this paper further, showing all the different algorithms that they test, and then uh, the different ablations, the details of how they come to these conclusions. One of the most interesting ideas in deep learning is applying the deep learning tools for software engineering or code data. So say using uh, sequence to sequence learning to generate documentation for Python code or say source code summarization, taking a bunch of Python code and then summarizing it in natural language to describe what it does. Or also a really exciting idea is the uh, git commit uh, message creation generation. So say you you know you have a new commit, new changes to the code, and then natural language processing to automatically summarize what's been changed in this code to help with this idea of maintaining software. So probably best instead of me just trying to do this off memory, they actually list out these codes. So code documentation generation, this is where you're trying to generate uh, comments on functions or say something like that. Source code summarization, code comment generation, git commit uh, message generation, API sequence recommendation, and then program synthesis. So these are the six tasks that are tested in this framework of using uh, trans or using uh, transformers with, co with uh, code data. So this data is sourced from uh, GitHub, Stack Overflow, and then uh, I think a private data set of like a class homework assignment. So uh, they describe how, they, how much data they have for each of the programming languages, Python, Java, Go, PHP, Ruby, JavaScript, uh, how much data they have available, and also C Sharp and SQL and then uh, some domain specific language for the program synthesis task. So 
I don't know too much about that, so I'm not gonna talk about that. Uh, then there are some of the unlabeled data sets. So they do language modeling as well, and this kind of, uh, you know, the overall natural language processing, they throw the whole book at this problem. So the code search net corpus, uh, they have, they describe, I think they have something like 30 million lines of code. It might even, I think it's 46 million lines of code, somewhere in here it says something like that. So they have a lot of data to do uh, language modeling with this uh, code and then transfer it into, these are the, uh, the downstream labeled uh, supervised learning tasks. So overall, really interesting study, uh, different, describing how they, uh, also this is really interesting, describing how they tokenize, say like Python code. So they use uh, the tree sitter library and then I think Python, they described that Python also has a built-in tokenized library because they then uh, cite the Python 3.7 docs for how they tokenize Python code, how they tokenize Java code for this, uh, you know, for input to natural language processing. So pretty interesting thinking about the tokenizers for code as well as natural language would say things like, uh, I think they describe even later on how these tokens like import, uh, you know, while for these kind of like code things that you see all the time are encoded in this kind of tokenization framework or showing here like function, string, var, import, probably also like the parentheses and how you encode that kind of thing. So definitely an interesting idea. Uh, they describe their experiments with transfer learning, multitask transfer learning, or single task learning where you just go right to the supervised learning data set, how it transfers from say language modeling down to the downstream tasks, uh, and then different performance. So I think the biggest takeaway is that uh, when they don't have a lot of data, it doesn't perform well. And that might be because they don't have great data augmentation for these uh, specific uh, code frameworks and that kind of idea. So really interesting paper, a great uh, summarization of all these different ideas and some interesting experiments on uh, you know using natural language processing advances with code as the data source. New in natural language processing this week is a really interesting paper on the benchmark design for these uh, systems. What will it take to fix benchmarking in natural language understanding? So to preview this paper, it presents these four different ideas of criterion for natural language benchmarks. So say the glue benchmark, super glue, the knowledge intensive language task, the kilt benchmark, squad, so on, all these different benchmarks. They have these different kinds of problems. So the first of which is good performance on the benchmark should imply robust in-domain performance on the task. So what they're describing here is a lot of these uh, benchmarks, say like adversarial constructions, where you have like this arbitrary, uh, maybe it's like human design, like in the paper, learning the difference that makes a difference with counterfactually augmented data, where you have humans design how to flip the label on the data, or like uh, adversarial, like a noise map applied to the embedding, or some kind of data augmentation to interface a label switch, and then seeing how robust the model is to that. The authors of this paper are arguing that that can be kind of arbitrary about evaluating the model, and it really should be in domain. So, so much about out of domain, out of distribution generalization, but it still should, you know, the benchmark should represent good performance on this domain of this IID assumption that uh, the train and the test set both are sampled from the same distribution of data. Second of which is benchmark examples should be accurately and unambiguously annotated. So, I think no one would disagree with that. There should be, you know, consistency with human labeling for these data sets. Uh, benchmarks should offer adequate statistical power. So they should be uh, big data sets such that, you know, obviously big data sets is something that everyone wants with these data sets. And then fourth, benchmarks should reveal potentially harmful social biases and systems and should not incentivize the creation of bias systems. So uh, some kind of benchmark that would reveal what these biases are, maybe say like the checklist benchmark or uh, something like that that really probes into the behavior of these uh, systems. So Overall, really interesting paper, uh, further describing each of these different ideas, taking apart the four challenges and, you know, the key solutions and problems with the solutions and so on, and then kind of sketching out a solution. So really interesting paper on improving the benchmarks that are used to really measure and compare progress in natural language processing to begin with. One of the most exciting ideas in natural language processing is pattern exploiting training. Pattern exploiting training describes how to use these pre-trained generative language models for data augmentation with supervised learning where you have a limited labeled data set. So as shown in the paper, the way that you uh, use patterns is you insert these patterns like these text templates to turn any kind of task into a language modeling task. So say you have unlabeled data and you don't have the time to label it, you use these patterns to let the language model label the data. So this study, uh, in a previous episode of the AI Weekly Update, we covered this paper, how many data points is a prompt worth? So these researchers from Hugging Face have done a large scale experiment to take apart how much uh, data efficiency you get by using this pattern exploiting training idea of using these prompting uh, algorithms. So this blog post is really great as well. You can interactively explore the, these different tasks. So I think these are the different uh, super glue benchmark things, Boolean questions. Uh, natural language inference, the two things that I can, I think this Winograd schema challenge is things that I can remember at the top of my head, but these are the different uh, super glue benchmarks and you can click on different points to see the data efficiency. So as we click here, you see that 
in this uh, regimen of uh, something like a thousand data points is what you have in the uh, labeled set by prompting compared to just fine-tuning a classification head on the base model representation from the pre-trained generative language model you achieve a data advantage of 680 data points you can click on any kind of uh, region of this graph to see how much uh, data you save by using prompting and by using pattern explaining training compared to this other idea where you just uh, take off the previous classification logit head put on a new one that has say the card output cardinality of the task so say if it's binary classification it has two logits or if it's multi-class classification it would have 10 logits or something like that and you fine tune a new uh, classification head so here's some more ablations of looking at the uh, verbalizers so the verbalizers are how you map from the vocabulary of the language model to the labels for this downstream task and this is uh, showing the different impact of those decisions and then uh, the performance of different patterns as well. So really interesting interactive blog post further describing this really important paper, uh, really doing a large scale experiment with this idea of pattern exploiting training. There's also a new survey out on recent approaches for natural language processing in low resource scenarios. So I didn't really have a chance to uh, dive deep into this paper, but here's the table outlining the high level solutions that are available. If you have a small data set, uh, your data set could be small in the sense that it, it has not a lot of labeled data or you don't even have unlabeled data, in which case you're probably out of luck. But here are some of the solutions that are available to you. There's data augmentation, there's weak supervision where you heuristically label data, uh, cross-lingual projections, so it's mostly uh, Low resource NLP is mostly referring to multilingual natural language processing where uh, you have some languages that you don't have a lot of data. So not just talking about uh, low so resource NLP, like say you've built some new question answering tasks, like say uh, COVID QA is an example of a data set that uh, I think when the paper was first published, they only had something like 124 uh, question answer label pairs. So that's obviously going to be hard to use a deep learning network with. But so this is mostly talking about uh, multilingual ideas. So cross-lingual projections, uh, language model domain ad adaptation, multilingual language models, adversarial discriminator, and then meta-learning. So here are some of the solutions that are covered in this paper. Again, I haven't really had the chance to uh, really read this and understand all these ideas, but uh, you know, obviously I'm really interested in data augmentation. I think this data augmentation is a really exciting idea. And this is These are describing the ways that you can use data augmentation and then these other ideas for overcoming this problem of learning with limited label data, one of the uh, toughest outstanding challenges of using deep learning. Transitioning from talking about this problem of learning from limited label data, the next probably big challenge in deep learning is measuring generalization. So this paper evaluating prediction time batch normalization for robustness under covariate shift is describing this ImageNet C data set and particularly looking at these uh, batch normalization parameters where you have this distribution shift. So uh, I think covariate shift just generally refers to generalization shift, but definitely when I think of it, I always associate it with the batch normalization paper that says like overcoming covariate shift with batch normalization. And so I always think of covariate shift, particularly that terminology is referencing the shift in the mean and the variance of the feature activations with different batches of data. And I kind of think that's generally how people describe it as well. But so this is highlighting this phenomenon of say, so, okay, so say you randomly sample some batch of CIFAR 10 images and the, it, or one image produces, or yeah, the batch of images produces this kind of distribution of the activations of, as you go across each channel, and then you go down you, each spatial location, then you go down the channel to sum up the mean and the variance for intermediate feature activations and say a convolutional feature map. So say on layer three of a convolutional neural network, you have some feature plane that has the spatial dimension of uh, 28 by 28 and then has 32 features. So you go across each, the position zero, zero, go down those 32 positions, calculate the mean, calculate the variance, plot that uh, to plot this distribution and so on for each of the different spatial locations. So, and then you're comparing the two different sample batches when you do that kind of calculation. So what batch normalization does is it normalizes the mean and the variance of these activations by using this learned scale and shift parameter to bring the features back to some kind of distribution. So instead of being distributed, uh, say like layer 18 looks like it's kind of all over the place, it will bring it into, so it's normally, or actually it's kind of, maybe layer seven is a better example of it being distributed all over the place. You normalize it so that it looks like Gaussians across each of the channel dimensions. So the idea of this paper is, you know, different from that. This, the, the idea of this paper is that you're able to calibrate batch normalization statistics by relying on, on this idea that when you're doing inference and you're experiencing test head distribution shift, you can use the statistics of the entire batch of predicted data because it's most likely that wherever you've deployed the model, that it's running batches of predictions that have this similar phenomenon of how the distribution has shifted. So a really interesting investigation further into this idea of how do we measure generalization and account for different kinds of distribution shift.
Also on the topic of dealing with generalization in deep learning, we have does your dermatology classifier know what it doesn't know, detecting the long tail of unseen conditions. So in addition to the, uh, they present a new algorithm for doing this out of distribution detection, but what I wanna present in this video is highlighting this uh, phenomenon of this long tail distribution for these uh, classes. So we already have this problem in machine learning of class imbalance. So say your data set is 80% majority, 20% uh, minority, your classifier is gonna be biased to predicting the majority instance. But this case is an extreme case of this where you have a long tail distribution of different classes that have few samples, but there's many examples of this. And I think for disease detection, this seems like something that'll probably be common, but generally just thinking about this, I think it's interesting to see this kind of problem that is definitely something that you wouldn't see too often in say a benchmark data set or something like that, but definitely an interesting problem to think about in this kind of out of distribution detection algorithm or whether it's still kind of like, maybe it's a meta learning problem. Think about like exactly what kind of problem set up this kind of long tail distribution of classes falls into. So interesting paper, uh, does your dermatology classifier know what it doesn't know? With access to things like Google Collab Notebooks where you have these free GPUs in the cloud and so on, and the advancement of cloud computing with these access to these computing resources, we're seeing more and more adoption of these large scale uh, models or language models probably more so particularly. Now we have an open implementation of a large scale GPT-3 model, GPT-NEO. So it was probably only like one year, one and a half years ago when OpenAI had made their GPT-2 that I think was 1.5 billion parameters or something like that, and it came with this announcement of watch out for this dangerous language model because it was such a crazy idea to have a billion parameter language model, and now you can load a 1.3 to 2.7 billion parameter GPT model in this Google Collab notebook. This, is, this notebook has everything you need to try it out and text some te test, some, <laughs> test some text generation prompts out like language completion and even code completion. So GBT uh, Neo from this company, uh, Eleuther AI, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, has open source thing. I think it's been trained on the Pile data set, about 800 gigabytes of text. And this notebook shows you how to use the Hugging Face pipeline, text generation, GBT Neo, uh, and then fill out these prompts. My name is Zach and I like to, and then it says, I've been, I like to talk about anything on this forum. I've been a fan of Nintendo Wii, so on. And then I think this is just amazing, mind blowing kind of idea. Below is React code for a to-do list app. And then look at this, import React component from React, import render from React DOM, import to-dos list, crazy, amazing that it can do this. And you know, obviously if you want to test out the generalization, here's the interface to the model. So if you want to design some kind of intuitive heuristic generalization test and see what this can do, here's all the code you need to play around with this amazing idea. Also on this topic is accessible multi-billion parameter model training with PyTorch Lightning plus DeepSpeed. So DeepSpeed is a library from Microsoft. It does these uh, you know, under the hood optimizations like the data distribution, the, per the parallelization of say like model parallelism and then data parallelism if you've read into these kind of distributed training ideas, but no need to do that because you can just use this one line of code to handle it with PyTorch Lightning. And you can train a 45 billion parameter model with this A100 server, well, you could do that with any kind of compute setup, it would just take more time probably. And then here are some uh, quick lines. That, this is kind of, so me personally, I'm definitely moving more towards PyTorch Lightning and really trying to learn this because, I mean, it, it's obviously popular. I've seen so many people recommend commenting on the YouTube channel, like, uh, you know, check out PyTorch Lightning and look at all this different functionality that it has with these one line of code, 16-bit uh, precision, early stopping, uh, you know, and then obviously this deep speed integration, this is a huge sell right here. So this idea of being able to train these massive models is a very exciting idea, uh, the deep speed integration and so on, and this is showing you how to use it to train these massive models. So at the end of the day, they, um, they're using this min GPT implementation and uh, they're training it with eight A100 GPUs. And I think somewhere in here, they show exactly how long that takes too, or, or they don't, but Anyway, so it's showing how to train these large models, and you know, I imagine it's not crazy expensive, probably not cheap either, but I mean, 45 billion parameters is a very interesting scale to have access to. So the last update is ICLR 2021 has announced the outstanding best paper awards from the you know highly prestigious ICLR 2021 conference. So uh, these are some pretty technical papers, and I was definitely uh, a bit intimidated by the you know the technicalness of these papers. So the first of which is beyond fully connected layers with quaternions, uh, parameterization of hyper complex multiplications with one over n parameters. So I tried to read this. I ended up in the three blue one brown video. Awesome explanation of quaternions and 
how this idea solves this problem of when you are trying to apply rotations in three-dimensional space. This, I think it's called like gumbo lock or something like that. Basically, you have this setting where you're rotating along two axes and then you lose a degree of freedom because uh, uh, it's not as flexible to do this matrix multiplication for rotations. And so they invented this quaternion space or quaternion, something like that, however you say it. Uh, and it has one real number, three imaginary numbers, this kind of four-dimensional tensor space. But for our interests of deep learning, they've figured out how to uh, organize fully connected layers with this quaternion multiple. So instead of Wx plus b, y equals Wx plus b, they replace it with this uh, quaternion parameterization, something like that. I don't know exactly what's happening, but they show empirically that it reduces the parameters dramatically. So it's kind of cr it's pretty interesting to think about, you know, expand your scope of thinking about these kind of ideas in deep learning. You know, me personally, I've, I would never in a million years think of an idea like this with thinking about how to improve deep learning systems. But uh, you know, very interesting to see this. And then. So uh, probably the only thing that this paper co complex query answering with neural link predictors describing how you uh, have a knowledge graph and then you try to predict edges between nodes. I think that's kind of the or, or also uh, rethinking architecture selection and differentiable neural architecture search. If you watch uh, these Henry ALA videos or yeah, like these kind of ideas, I think these are the only ones that are <laughs> that are kind of like will come quickly to you unless you have like a really mathematical background. So PCA is a Nash equilibrium game. This is, Another crazy idea, mesh-based simulation with graph networks, binaural speech this is pretty exciting. It's from Facebook as well, and describing how these like virtual reality helmets would do like three-dimensional sound. Uh, and then I have no idea what this is talking about. And then uh, this idea of these normalizing flows and building on that already crazy complex idea. So <laughs> overall, my opinion of this is that these are some pretty technical papers. Thank you so much for watching this AI Weekly Update. Uh, a bit of a quicker overview than some of the past videos that have more of a deeper dive and you know, future videos will be more deep dive like that. So maybe kind of alternating between, really depends on how much time I have to read these kinds of papers. But overall, I hope you got a quick sense of these different updates, some exciting ideas, self-supervised learning, the general purpose vision systems, uh, this really great GAN survey, new advances in natural language processing, trying to fix the benchmarks, uh, doing it with code data and then seeing the limits of this pattern explaining training thing and some solutions to you know limited data different ways of looking at generalization and then this really exciting gpt neo thing uh, pytorch lightning and deep speed and then these iclr 2021 best papers so uh, this is the recap for april 12th and then uh, see you next week for the next ai weekly update mm -hmm.